Firstly, hello and welcome to the Clean Energy Zone panel session, uh, Empowering Students. The Clean Energy Zone is hosted in Ryerson Center for Urban Energy and is a startup incubator focused on clean, sustainable energy innovations that addresses social, societal needs. My name is Farhan Zia and I'm the Senior Manager of Strategic Initiatives in the Office of Zone Learning at Ryerson. Zone Learning prepares students for the 21st century employment by developing entrepreneurial mindsets and skill sets. Our 10 on-campus startup incubators, or as we call them, zones, are enthusiastic com communities invested in tackling real-world challenges with innovative solutions. Since 2010, our zones have incubated more than 3,500 startups, supported, more than, supported by more than 5,600 innovators, creating more than 4,000 jobs, and raising more than $1 billion in funding. From the very beginning, the Clean Energy Zone has been focused on empowering energy entrepreneurs, supporting innovations ranging from electric vehicles to renewable energy, energy storage and distribution, microgrids, and net zero city building. The Zone encourages its members to consider the positive environmental, social, and economic impact that they can influence. To help its members achieve this, the Zone brings together intersections of industry leaders, cutting edge researchers, and a range of national and international partners. This mixture provides a valuable contribution to the student experience by supporting pathways upon which students can begin their entrepreneurial journey. This morning, we will hear about those journeys firsthand from three entrepreneurs at the Clean Energy Zone, all of whom just also happen to be graduates from Ryerson. Firstly, Nima Albavai is the co-founder of BKR Energy. BKR uses cloud-based smart algorithms and artificial intelligence to reduce the energy cost and carbon emissions in your HVAC system, which is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Nima also holds his PhD in net zero energy building operational strategy planning from Ryerson University. Good morning, Nima. Oh, you're on, you're muted, Nima. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Perhan, for introducing me. Yeah, so my name is Nima. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO in BKR Energy. Uh, so in this company, we are focusing on residential HVAC system and more on the hybrid HVAC systems. We are providing a smart controllers cloud-based controllers to optimize the performance of hybrid HVAC system uh, in order to bring some energy cost saving and bill saving for the homeowners and in order to decrease the GHG and carbon emission uh, from the HVAC system. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Nima. Thank uh, Next, I'd like to introduce Bolas Ibrahim. Uh, Bolas launched Argentum as an undergraduate student in electrical engineering. Argentum reduces the building's electricity demand through a plug-and-play IoT-enabled DC power distribution system. The system augments existing building power structures to dramatically improve energy performance. Welcome, Bolas. Hey, thank you, Farhan. Yeah, you <laughs> pretty much said exactly what we do. We design primarily, we design direct current or DC power distribution systems uh, to reduce electricity consumption for LED lighting and HVAC. We also design wireless sensor networks uh, that go around and help us optimize the energy performance in the space. And lastly, we, we build digital twin software, basically a digital representation of the buildings that you live and work in. Fantastic. Being the only non-engineering uh, graduate in the room, I'm doing uh, everything I can to try to understand the tech aspects of each of your companies as best as I can. Uh, finally, Thomas Martin is the Director of Business Development at Switch. Uh, Switch provides end-to-end -end electric vehicle charging and energy management, optimizing charger use and simplifying building, uh, billing, streamlining the charging experience for drivers. Thomas joined Switch while at a student in Ryerson's Masters of Engineering, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship program. Hey, Thomas. Thanks for having me. Um, I joined Switch when uh, it was just three of us at the time. Um, 
And I was mentioning to Farhan before the call, it was kind of just a coincidence that I met Carter and Laura, who are the um, two co-founders. Um, we were about uh, 20 employees now, which is exciting. And having started at Q, um, it's uh, it's always you know fun to stay involved, and in, especially in the Ryerson community. Um, the energy space isn't uh, isn't that big, so you you come we come across each other at uh, conferences and we hear each other's names with uh, similar customers as well. Fantastic! Uh, once again, welcome to all three of you, um, and we'll we'll jump right into the to our first uh, discussion question. Um, we're speaking specifically about uh, how. Uh, Q and the Clean Energy Zone have impacted student experience today. Um, and so when thinking about student entrepreneurship, there's one major uh, challenge that is fairly common across the board, and that's access, right? Access to entrepreneurship. Students are already facing time crunches between lectures, labs, assignments, and then you also have a life to live, right? You have your own community, you, uh, you have family responsibilities, you might also be working, you might be commuting back and forth, back when we used to commute daily. Um, and in between all those moments uh, uh, is when you're trying to find time to work on your startup. And so Bolas, we'll begin with you. How did you juggle time between your start startup and your academic studies? <laughs> it was hard. Um, it was definitely hard. It's a lot of like getting good at like time management for sure. Uh, ultimately what I did though, just like to be practical and honest with everyone, is I went part time. So I I, I like uh, went down from full time studies into into part time studies uh, for some time. So I did complete the degree in seven years instead of four. So I took an extra took an extra few years to to complete the degree, um, but it was well worth it. Like I got uh, being being a student has its advantages, uh, and uh, yeah. So so going part time was a big part of like what I did. Uh, trying to juggle it full time, especially with engineering. Engineering is like consumes your entire life, uh, an engineering degree. So, yeah, that's what I did. I went part time. I'm sure it was not an easy decision to go from full time to part time. How did you reconcile it, or was there a particular catalyst that kind of said, "Okay, you know what? I'm starting to see some some momentum or something, and I have to dedicate more time." Yeah, we had like uh, we had a lot of things going. So like uh, patent applications that ultimately were granted. So uh, a lot of funding coming in. Um, it was a mix of the funding and the traction, like the technical traction, that I looked at and I said, you know what, it's worth it. Like it's worth it to to extend the degree to go part time, and to continue trying to build this uh, instead of like putting it on hold to graduate uh, and then building it a little bit later. I think it was the right decision. I think it was the right choice. It gave me uh, some more time at Ryerson. I also got to focus uh, more um, in depth on the courses that I was taking. So taking between two to three courses, I was able to like extract more from the courses, uh, really give like more of myself to those courses versus taking the five or six courses and, and rushing them all. So actually like in general, like startup aside, doing the part-time studies was, was definitely beneficial. That's amazing. It's it's fantastic that you found a way to sort of balance all of your priorities in a way that ended up being beneficial to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Nima, in your case, I mean, you were studying at the at the PhD level, at the doctorate level. What tips would you have for any students who are uh, planning to or who have currently launched a startup? Yeah, so it's a tough job. As actually Bullis just mentioned, this is not easy to be done. Uh, so right now, actually, I'm only focusing on the startup company because I was graduated in 2017. So after that, only focusing on my startup company. But before 2017, so you know, this is PhD. This is not actually easy. And I had too much to do for researching because, you know, actually, we all going to have a supervisor. And uh, so we need to publish journal papers, conference papers. So that's why all the time you need to be involved in the research, in the development. And this is taking actually too much time uh, for uh, uh, during the PhD course. But anyway, uh, uh, I try to be very quick and fast uh, on academia researches. 
uh, uh, to provide the uh, daily, daily, uh, daily rep oh my God, to provide the reports and papers actually as soon as I can to save some time, to spare some time. And then I use that actually saved time to only focus uh, on the startup company to educate myself what I need to do as a good entrepreneur to get the company up and running and how I can actually develop my product, how I can propose the product to the market. So that means by saving some time during the PhD researches, I could find uh, some moment to educate myself, myself to train myself uh, to be a good entrepreneur. So I, I think actually this is doable. And when I have done that with PhD, I hope the other actually students which are bachelor or master, they can 100% actually do that, uh, do this. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is what actually I've done during my PhD course. It's very, very interesting. And I'm, I'm actually curious. I mean, I know that your, your PhD topic was had some some links towards the startup that you launched in terms of topic, but I'm wondering, were there skills that maybe you saw develop from having to do research within the PhD program or having to grow the startup that you saw um, benefit you on the other side? For example, uh, conducting interviews or, or what might become market research or something like that. Um, you know, my startup company was initiated based on my studies at PhD because I found one of the PhD researches very good for marketing. And I, I saw at that moment there is a good market for the research. Actually, I'm working on that. So uh, that's why actually I initiated my startup company. But when you are going to the company, everything is different. So you need to learn how to interact with the other customers, how to go to the market. So, I mean, after entering to the company, everything changed because it was totally new environment for me because I was coming from academia without any experience uh, for marketing or product development. So, um, uh, so yeah, after interning, uh, I was actually facing with different kind of challenges and issues. So that's why I didn't disappoint it. I forced myself to be more involved into that, to train more, to learn more, and to catch up, to get the startup company up and running. And this is actually what I did. And now actually we have BKR Energy working up and running, providing the technology and introducing the technology to the market. Uh, but yeah, but at first it's going to be a little tough for the students who have actually no knowledge of working on a startup company. It definitely sounds like between uh, yourself and Bolus, there's a, a growing theme of uh, needing to be self-analytical and knowing sort of your strengths and, and where, um, where you might need assistance in order to try to make decisions about how you best manage your time. Uh, Thomas, in your case, you joined uh, a startup that was founded by, by uh, two other individuals or co-founded by two other individuals. What was uh, your experience in uh, entering uh, the startup world while also kind of trying to do your studies? Yeah, um, for me, all of my courses were in the evening. Um, I actually, um, I met Laura and Carter, um, I think a couple weeks after I'd finished my undergrad. And at the time I actually had um, a full-time job lined up for a company in engineering. Um, I did my undergrad in aerospace. So I had a job, full-time job um, lined up and I actually had started working. Um, for this company and I, I knew it would be a good job on kind of a probably a three to four year time frame but I knew um, I had that urge to kind of get back to um, the roots of engineering and start fresh with a, a company that was um, forming so when I met when, when we started to get switch rolling um, a lot of that was validating our ideas 
um, which is which is a very very different um, uh, task when compared to designing technical products. Um, validation is 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 ultimately what help, holds good ideas back from the market because uh, when it comes time for customers to start spending money, um, it needs to be a perfect fit. Um, great ideas are great ideas, but unless they're a perfect fit and people are willing to spend money, um, there's still work to do. So we've spent, we spent a lot of time while I was doing my master's, um, doing validation and, um, a lot of my coursework actually aligned perfectly to what we were doing at the time, which was doing research and finding out what is the reality in the industry that we're trying to penetrate. Um, what are the buying decisions that customers are are considering in the industry? So part of that was talking to cust real customers. So, you know, we were pitching, um, you know, we were pitching our our initial versions of the product while it was um, still in development, and this was you know four years ago at this point. But um, that process allowed us to iterate very quickly and understand. Okay. We have this idea. We have this idea for product and service. Um, how does it fit? How much are people willing to pay? What makes us? What are our competitors doing? And and that um, that humbling experience still lives with us today when we're you know 18, 20 employees where um, we're still learning at at the same rate, um, but the scale is larger. Um, so it's. It's something that we've ingrained into the company culture, which is, you know, treat every opportunity as a learning experience and treat every customer as someone who you can learn from because everyone's experiences in the energy space are different. Um, and uh, as probably Bolas and Nima know, um, energy problems change geography to geography. Who is your local utility? Who's your generator? And, and what are the pricing rates? Um, so that, that helps us. Um, the experience that we're gaining from these different geographies builds up a, a wealth of knowledge that we can then, you know, keep and be industry leaders with. Um, thank you, Thomas. So you, you hit on a number of interesting points there. Um, yeah. The the one that, that kind of sticks with me right now is the idea of validation as a learning process that continues on. Um, you know, I think it was... Uh, I think I heard it earlier this week, a, a quote from C blank and I'm paraphrasing, but it, it's something to the fact that your product is not necessarily the market's problem. Right. And so trying to, to work backwards from what is, what is the challenge that your, uh, your, your customers or the market that you're trying to reach is actually facing and how can your, your, uh, your product or your solution actually fit that rather than saying I've, got this great idea, we've developed it, and here it is, who can we sell it to? It's who wants to buy that, or who has a need, and what can we develop that actually fits that? And that idea of um, validation as not just a business process, but a learning process, is one of the reasons why, uh, or maybe one of the reasons why, I should say, uh, why we're seeing post-secondary institutions uh, starting to create more and more spaces for student venture creation. Um, and so uh, while we start to see more colleges and universities start to build incubators, accelerators, or even research commercialization programs, um, Nima, what, in your opinion, were some of the benefits of founding a company specifically while at a university? You're muted again, Nima. There's 2020, 2021's quote of the year, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, I received too many actually good benefits from Killing Energy Zone as one of the Ryerson Zones. Uh, because, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, when you are a student and when you are actually uh, in the academic area, you have almost time for whatever actually you want to do. So that's why um, that's why actually uh, you can have get access to very good actually resources which Kilin Energy Zone actually provided to me. For example, at that time, so I needed to have a co-working space, working desk, uh, internet, meeting room. So those are the initials and the principles for a startup company. 
and clean energy zone actually share those actually areas, those actually resources with me. And uh, I received very good training uh, uh, sessions and uh, from Clean Energy Zone on different actually aspect of the work, like marketing, uh, fund rising, and um, product development. And even Clean Energy Zone introduced uh, very good um, uh, uh, mentors actually to me in different actually areas, which. Uh, I took too much actually advantage from actually those mentors. Um, and when you are working at university, um, if you fail, you still actually have time to catch up. So you're not going to lose all everything. So uh, you may actually use something, lose something, but you can pivot and you can actually start again. So this, those are the benefits of uh, working on a startup company when you are still a student. Uh, yeah, those are the benefits actually I received uh, from my previous actually work at Kilit Energy Zone and Ryerson. That's fantastic. And it, it really does speak to the value of, um, of, a, of a learning environment as a place to try to create something brand new. Because to your point, Nima, it's almost as though it's a safe place to experiment, to fail, and then to iterate and, and grow from there. It's not, uh, it's not so cut and dry. And it, it also addresses um, some of the stigma around entrepreneurship, especially for students in, in non-business or non-engineering programs who might not see themselves as entrepreneurs, primarily because they, they either don't have, have not developed or don't have exposure to, to some of the skills gaps like you mentioned, right, not knowing uh, marketing, for example, it's something that can be learned if you have passion to 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 push forward and to to pick those up as you need to. Um, Bolus, in your case, how do you think that the experience of launching a startup would have differed if you had been working out of, uh, say, a non-university linked co-working space? It wouldn't have been as uh, like smooth or or fast. So I think one of the one of the uh, key benefits of being inside of the like zone learning, for example, uh, which is like the the entrepreneurial ecosystem that like Ryerson built for the students and for the community. Um, I think one of them is like the speed at which you can you can learn like the process, right? There's like enough learning resources. And like you touched on this a little bit earlier, like the most important one is that you're not building a solution to a problem that doesn't exist, that you're starting with a problem that exists and it's like a good quality problem that people are experiencing uh, may, like hopefully every day, multiple times a day. Um, one that is, is like a pain to solve and one that people would pay to solve. So like that was the, that was one of the key like learning focuses that like I feel like zone learning hit uh, right on was uh, was focusing on the problem, not the solution. And engineers like to focus on solutions. <laughs> they like to focus on like cool technology or like technology first uh, versus instead of like problem or market first. And that's what like we call product market fit. Um, so yeah, definitely like one of the one of the biggest benefits like aside from all the things that Nima mentioned, which is like of course like having a space and. Uh, and a, and a space where you can network easily with other entrepreneurs who are at similar stages, um, bringing in like they did the entrepreneurs in residence and innovators in residence programs, uh, bringing outside uh, mentorship into the space is also key. Uh, but yeah, that one of the one of the biggest ones is the speed at which you can learn, the speed at which you can validate like what you think about uh, like the world, like all of your assumptions about the world, and test those assumptions. Uh, with other entrepreneurs and other uh, like mentors and leaders, that was a, a key of like this ecosystem that was put together. The the it's speaking to the ecosystem, it um, it's it's organic uh, in terms of how how growth comes, right? And it's very much informed by by individuals like yourselves looking at what um, what needs that you have and what uh, what what resources or what supports or what network connections need to be brought in in order to help provide that, right? And so, Thomas, in your case, I'm curious about how um, having access to the ecosystem as a student, having access to, to startups and to incubators, uh, impacted your experience. Yeah, um, it, it was very valuable and still is. Um, I was, for, for those who weren't on the 
call 10 minutes ahead, I was literally mentioning to Farhan, you know, these are good resources for companies like us to um, attract students that are willing to work hard. Um, so, you know, that's part of the reason we're, you know, still very involved. Um, if you look at the first eight switch employees, all of them came from the Ryerson ecosystem. Um, you know, just, you know, bumped into this guy and we got talking and turns out he's interested in EV charging and, you know, two weeks later he was working for us. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I think the first eight people were actually all through either Q or just the Ryerson uh, zone ecosystem. Um, and then branching out from that, um, you then expand your ecosystem to all the, the local incubators and that's just another way to meet people interested and learn from their experiences. Um, I know in our cases, we're still in, in touch with a lot of the, the co-founders and founders that we've met in the industry and in the ecosystem because they often have little tips and tricks that they've learned along the way and they can share. Um, a good example is um, um, an ind a co-founder that we met at a local incubator, not at Ryerson, but in Toronto. Um, we were looking for office, office and storage space within the GTA that was affordable and accessible, and we were having a hard time finding it. And she actually ran a company that did just this and uh, helped us find a facility that met our budget and that uh, we can rent office space from. And we're still, we have two locations. One of our locations is that same location that we've been at for probably two years now. Um, so just little nuggets of information, um, you know, usually through conversation that, you know, you meet somebody at an event, you, you know, um, talk about your experiences and you, you pick up these things along the way that help influence your decisions going forward. And it's hard to quantify what that is, but that's just kind of shared wisdom in a way, or shared knowledge. The the ability to just be in a space, whether it's in person or, or virtually, where you're meeting other eager individuals who are looking for connections, whether they be just to bounce ideas off of each other, or whether, in the case that you mentioned, it's it's for a potential uh, uh, relationship or, or, or business connection right um, and actually this is this is one of the the key messages that we put in front of students especially those who are at the very beginning of exploring what entrepreneurship might be able to offer them whether they are considering to launch their own startup or whether they're just thinking about um, uh, uh, what skills that they might be able to learn or, or building a network for themselves or how they might be able to add to their resume. So, uh, Thomas, and we'll begin with you in, in this sense. Um, what what would you say to students who are thinking about joining the clean energy zone? Um, yeah, th this is a. I, I'll kind of I'll come back to your question, but th this question in particular kind of hits a note with me. Um, when when I first was looking for um, an alternative path to that job that I had lined up out of undergrad, um, I, I didn't have much bargaining power as a student because what I was saying was, I want to get out of this line of uh, industry that I've been trained in, which was aerospace. So um, what I actually did was when I met Carter and Laura, I basically said, hey guys, like, I like the idea, I'm aligned with your vision, I'll, I'll work for free until we start figuring out finances. Um, and it took a while for us to pay ourselves and but I was willing to do that and that just proved as an individual I was willing to you know make sacrifices and, and work hard um, and in a way that's part of the reason I feel so strongly towards our, our idea and our companies because we put in the hard work and sacrifices um, when joining uh, if you want to approach a startup um, I think getting involved in the clean energy zone ecosystem is, is a great first step um, because again you can meet people and, and kind of gauge the in, the industry and what segment of the industry you want to go into just through conversations and and also listening to events like this um, and then from there you can branch out and kind of fine-tune where you want to target whether you go into kind of Bolus's line of thinking or or Nima or myself there's tons of different streams you can you can specialize in um, being in the energy industry alone is is a very broad term. So 
Um, I, would, I would just say Clean Energy Zone is a very good first step. And then from there, you are looking and networking and developing the skills you would need to align with a company's vision. And, and I, for what it's worth, I know, um, I think part of what small companies want to see is, are these people willing to make the sacrifices the founders and the early employees have made in align with their vision? And I think if you can be upfront and communicate that, it will build a lot of trust um, for potentially having you on board. It's, it, your story is very, uh, it's very telling, right? It, it speaks to um, how you were willing to take a brave step away from what is likely a very traditional career path with some stability and a paycheck coming in, right? Um, and that's ultimately the goal for a large population of students, right? You go to school to graduate and to get a job, right? That's, that's the traditional linear pathway. But the reality is that majority of career paths are, are non-linear. And increasingly, entrepreneurship is being viewed as a, a non-traditional outcome for, uh, for students to, to strongly consider. And it, it, it really is um, come back to the skills that you might develop that can inform employability, as you mentioned, Thomas, or it can turn into something that, uh, that, that you find self-motivation based on a, a particular personal passion. And so in, in that case, uh, Nima, I'm, I'm curious if you have any advice for students who are thinking about taking the first step towards entrepreneurship. One more time, you're still on mute. So I need to actually put a function in here to just remind me, okay, I need to un unmute myself each time. Yeah, sorry for this. Uh, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, as long as you are a student, the only concern is to provide a good response or I don't know, good answer to the exercise you are receiving from your prof or supervisor. And this is the only concern. If you have done a good job, you're gonna get a A plus. And if your work, for example, is not very satisfying, so you're gonna get actually lower uh, score or mark, but that's all. But when you are going to the startup company, everything actually is gonna be different. So you are facing with different obstacles, challenges, issues, which you have never experienced that before in an academia environment. Uh, so Clean Energy Zone, providing that space uh, and resources to give the opportunity to you to exercise new challenges, to make yourself ready for new actually obstacles, to, to learn how to run a startup company. So when you have some mentors, when you have, I'm sorry, some uh, support receiving from Killing Energy Zones, so that means you can have new experiences. You can teach yourself how to provide res uh, respond uh, to something which you have never experienced before. Um, and since actually you're not going to lose too much because this is still an incubator and so you have not yet done significant uh, investment actually on that. So you have the opportunity to make mistakes, to learn from the mistakes and to uh, do a kind of listen and learn in the upcoming actually project. So uh, those are the benefits Killing Energy Zone as one of the Ryerson actually zones providing to the new students and giving the opportunity, time, and chance to uh, work on the topics, on the issues which you have never experienced before. And this is very valuable because you want to educate yourself. And when you are entering into a real world, you know actually how some of the process going forward and you can of course better actually handle that. Uh, so those are the benefit, the advantage I can see coming from uh, Ryerson zones, including clean energy zone. Uh, I, I, I absolutely agree with you Nima, especially to your, to your final point there about um, the, the experience that you take away from, if nothing else, 
attempting to, to create something for yourself or contributing to an early stage startup in, in some way, uh, how it provides you with almost intangible skills that you might not otherwise be able to develop. It's not um, the same types of uh, you know, hard or technical skills uh, that you might be able to develop in a classroom setting, but being, able, being responsible or accountable for, for tasks uh, or being required to wear multiple different hats and adapt to new scenarios, as you put it, um, and to develop those new skills in, in situations that you've never been in before or might not have ever been exposed to before, right? Um, yeah. And how that might carry forward uh, to, help, to help you grow as an individual, right? Regardless of what, what pathway you go forward in. Um, yeah. Uh, so I would like to just add something actually in here. Um, because uh, when you are a student, you have friends. Those are friends, so you are in a different actually environment. But when you are going to a startup com company, you have team members. And behavior, the team members' behavior, reaction, everything is different from friends. So, um, so in, in the clean energy zone, you can learn how to behave, how to react with the team members to get the startup company up and running. So those are all new experience which you cannot, you know, um, experience that during the, the time when you are actually a student. So this is one of the additional actually benefit just as part on top of my head. No, that's that's fantastic, and it, it speaks to your own unique journey. Um, as you've grown, right? Those interpersonal skills that would have been developed by being exposed to different types of communities, right? They even might have been the same people that you would have seen in your classroom, but in the class, they're, they're classmates and their friends, and in the zone, they're, they're colleagues and they're, and they're like-minded entrepreneurs, right? And, and, or, or coming to work for you and becoming a teammate, right? Like it's very, a very different dynamic between, between uh, uh, yourself and, and others. Uh, Bolus, uh, turning to you on this one, do you have any advice that you would uh, put forward to any students at any level, undergraduate or graduate, uh, who are thinking about taking the first step? Yeah, it's a, it's a definitely like one of the best times in your life to, to take that like risk and try it out uh, and try out, uh, like try your hand out at entrepreneurship um, because like your level of responsibility, like it's pretty low <laughs> outside of like your outside of school, right? Like uh, for for most people, so it's a it's a really good time. So um, the best advice I can give is to focus on the, it's like the the number one thing is to focus on the problem. Like what is it that you're passionate about solving? So not don't focus so much on like what you're passionate about like doing or building, right? Like that's a good that's a good indication to yourself of like what you might be interested in working on. But uh, honestly, it should be, it should, the focus should always be like, what is the problem that I'm solving? And what's the quality of this problem? And again, quality of the problem, I'll, I'll always say this, comes back to like, how, how many times a day do people experience this problem? Do they experience this problem daily? Is it like a once a year problem? Is it, um, the, the higher the quality of the problem, the more uh, your chance of success is. Because uh, your success is really like, dependent upon the problem. How you solve that problem is like less relevant. It's like basically the quality of the problem that you pick. And that's like uh, the best advice I can give to students because I don't think that's like something you learn in, in class. Uh, you learn a lot about like solutions. You don't really learn about like why we had to come up with these solutions. And you study the solutions that other scientists or other inventors or other engineers came up with, but not really like the motive or the impetus for like why they came up with those solutions. Um, that's more like history class. Um, so. So yeah, that's the, the best advice I can give to students is that this is like a good time to, to take that risk and to try your hand out at it. It's not an easy thing. Uh, surround yourself with the right like people, with the right network. So zone learning is, is a great way to do it. Um, the zone learning ecosystem, there are like zones and different verticals. So if like energy is your thing, the clean energy zone is a great place um, to, to do that. It's, it's, like a, it's like an incubator. It's like a, exactly like what an incubator should be in like every sense of the word. Um, so yeah, join an incubator, 
put yourself in a, in a good like space ecosystem and make sure you focus on like the quality of the problem that you're solving and that you understand truly like what is this problem? What are the economics of this problem that you're solving? Uh, and what is the impact uh, to the world of the problem that you're solving? Um, yeah, it's the advice I'd give to students. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right, we have just a couple more minutes here. So I just want to sneak in one more question. Um, Thomas, maybe we'll start with you. Um, uh, because we've heard similarly from, from Nima and, and Bolas, and I'm curious about your perspective on it. It's that, you know, Zones and the experience offers a wide range of resources uh, to, to members, right? And that's, you know, community, uh, as Nima mentioned, that's um, uh, skills development or, or learning exercises, uh, as Bolas has pointed out, but also, you know, perks, facilities, uh, networks, discounted software, whatever that might be. What was one specific resource um, that you came across or that you utilized that, um, that was most helpful to you? Um, it's hard to put my finger on a, like, a finite resource. I, I honestly think just the, the power of the network, um, I think it is the number one by, by a long shot. Um, meeting people and being involved in the ecosystem i think is number one um I, I in my experience there's a lot of focus today on you know get skills and go get certifications and this and that and that's great but likely need a bit of a network to get introduced to the industry and find out where you fit um and i would say it's it's a probably a 50 50 split between the skills that you acquire as well as um who you know so being involved in attending th things like this, uh, whether they're online or in person, and then just getting to know the community, I think is a, is a very powerful tool when you're starting out. Fantastic. Uh, Nima, for yourself, what was maybe one resource that uh, you didn't expect would be of value to you until, uh, until you needed it, until you used it? It's your final test, and you, you, you're still on mute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very good to have you actually here, you know. <laughs> uh, so the first actually resource is the co-working area and labs, uh, because to do the pro, uh, pro, uh, product development, you need to run different trial tests to see if product is providing what you are looking for or not. So uh, Clean Energy Zone, uh, actually you know gave us a co-working desk and labs so we could actually run the trial test we needed and the other one is uh, financial credits because right now actually we are working with aws uh, and so for the services we are receiving from them we need to actually you know they're going to charge us but because the credit we receive from clean energy zone this is actually almost free for us. So that means uh, it's not going to have financial burden on the BKR company at the moment, just because of the credit, the financial credit we receive from Clean Energy Zone. So those are the most valuable um, supports and um, uh, yeah, uh, support actually we receive from Clean Energy Zone. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. And Bolas, I'll give you the last word over here on this one. Uh, what was maybe one one resource or or uh, a part that you did not know was available through the zone that came in handy for you? Well, I'll echo like exactly like what Thomas said. There's the infinite resource of networking. Uh, that's uh, you can't put a price on that because you don't know what'll come out of that. Uh, and like Nima said, the like cloud credits, like there's you could get up to a hundred thousand dollars in AWS cloud cloud credits. Um, and so that's like a that's pretty good. <laughs> like that's that's insane. So you get to save uh, the first hundred thousand dollars you would have paid in cloud credits. Um, there's tons of credits like that for different things that are available. Um, there's probably over like a quarter of a million dollars in value that you can recapture just by being a part of the ecosystem. Um, the biggest benefit that I had personally was the connection to funding opportunities. So uh, a lot of like through the zone, like just being in the zone, the connection to like non-dilutive funding opportunities has totaled us close to a quarter of a million. And to funding opportunities, like uh, dilutive funding opportunities, again, close to half a million. So close to three quarters of a million dollars in, uh, in funding. So funding was, was like a huge one. 
uh, being a part of the zone and just trying to take advantage of the different opportunities that are available. The zone is really good at pushing out the clean energy zone and like the different um, zones, all of them, uh, and zone learning in general, really good at pushing funding opportunities to the founders uh, and making sure that they're relevant to the founders uh, is, is one of the biggest uh, benefits. Obviously, it's like competitive and difficult and it's not guaranteed, but that was one of the biggest benefits that I had was the access to funding opportunities that I otherwise wouldn't have known about. So yeah, that was uh, that's probably like one of the biggest benefits. I mean, to any founder, like the biggest struggles are what like time and money, um, and technical ability. But like we're engineers, so but time and money. So um, yeah, giving, like uh, helping out with that money side of the equation is is uh, it's pretty good. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. It looks like uh, we're at time. So I want to thank all three of the panelists, Thomas, Nima, Bolas, I, you've shared some incredible insights today and I think it's really helpful to any of the students who are on the call. Um, overall, Ryerson aims to cultivate a student experience that equips all students with the knowledge, the skills, the competencies that they need to flourish and contribute to our ever-changing world, including specifically the, the energy sector. Uh, thank you to, to uh, Q and to the Clean Energy Zone for having this event and reminding us of all of this. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended uh, for your attention uh, today. The energy sector is transforming and the clean energy zone is at the very forefront of that transformation. And I encourage you to engage with the zone, meet its entrepreneurs uh, through events like this, or find out how you can support or join Ryerson's innovation ecosystem through zone learning by visiting ryerson.ca slash zone learning, all one word. Thank you very much uh, once again to everyone and, and enjoy the rest of the expo. Thanks for having us, guys. Thanks. Much, yeah. Bye bye. Take Thank care. You.